Well, bless the Lord. Wow. Uh, I love that praise. And, you know, I always love seeing Mama Oya uh, before the people. And I love it even more when I feel your hearts and your soul, your spirit is engaged in the process. Um, bless God. Bless God. Bless God. I had to uh, find my footing. We were scrambling just a little bit before uh, the service. And, uh, you know, uh, but we found our footing. And I bless the Lord at uh, the potential uh, growth that I'm seeing in the process. And uh, I'm just so grateful because the more people are involved, the more I believe the manifestation of God's witness is uh, clearer to the people that he wants to receive the message that he's articulating. And uh, so I'm so grateful. Again, I want to thank Mama Oya for the, uh, the praise. Uh, <laughs> you see, you see how, how technology goes. You know, I look down at the microphone, want to pick up something and it picks up my breath and all of that. But uh, we're learning to work within the principles that govern this technology. It's a learning process, but it's a joyful process because it means progress, that we're moving in the direction of progress. And I always enjoy progressing. Well, uh, we're going to pray and, and go right into the message. This is the first Sunday of Communion Sunday. So, gracious Father, we bow our heads and we close our eyes and we just thank you, Father, for this period, even as we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is calming our hearts and soothing our souls and quieting our minds so that the voice of the Holy Spirit will be prominent above all else that tries to get our attention. We pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you will speak forth your will to our hearts, our soul, our spirit. We pray, Father, that the Spirit of the Lord will give us the interpretation and the clarity of what you are saying from your throne into the kingdom of God that is manifested here on this earth. We love you, Lord, with all of our hearts. We give you all of our being. And Father, we say, let your perfect will be done in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, family, uh, it is a joy to stand before you today. It's a joy to, uh, I'm gonna move this mic down just a bit. Okay, it's a joy to stand before you. It's a joy to serve the Lord. And it's a joy to see another year. Although God is not hung up in calendars, he uses calendars, but you know, one day it's not esteemed greater than the next. So in the spirit, we, we just continue to move on according to God's will. But the title of today's message, if we have to give it a title is, uh, Balanced Power, Balanced Power Heals the Woes of Hypocrisy. Balanced Power. Power heals, H-E-A-L-S, heals the woes of hypocrisy. And the imbalance of power, this is not the title, but the imbalance of power creates woes of hypocrisy. Now, you may ask the question, <clears throat> what is a, a woe? A woe is any condition of deep suffering from misfortune, affliction, and grief. It is oftentimes characterized as a calamity or affliction uh, that leads to ruin and, and leads to trouble. And, and often you will see, or in the scriptures you will see Jesus referring or using the word woe over and over again. And the imbalance of power is contrary to the will of God 
And since it's contrary to the will of God, it doesn't produce the kingdom of God, the, the peace and the joy and the righteousness of God. It produces deeper and deeper and more systemic and institutionalized hypocrisy. And, you know, the hypocrisy is that, you know, uh, one of its philosophies is don't do as I do, just do as I say. That's uh, a philosophy of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is, in, in psychological terms, is just the wearing of a mask, uh, pretending to be something that you are not. And, and regarding the heart, it's pretending to love and to care about people when you really could care less about them or their welfare. And this message is important because uh, in order to advance the kingdom of God, there are certain things that we have to come to grips with. The other morning, uh, I got up very early and I don't recall whether it was in my sleep or if it was when I was just bowing before the Lord, but I saw this log, big log, and a hatchet had, you know, or an ax had split the log in half. And what I realized was, was that uh, the log was more symbolic of the United States, that we are all part of the same tree, no matter what you think about it, we're all part of the same tree. And in that tree, there are many branches and you know, there are religious branches, cultural branches, there are economic branches. There are all sorts of branches in this tree, but there was an ax. And the assignment that has been given to all of us is to heal the breach that has come into the tree. And in order to preach the entire message that the Lord, uh, I believe, revealed to my heart will take at least, you know, three or four Sundays, maybe two or three Sundays. But if I took my time, I think it would take at least three or four Sundays uh, to preach. So if that's the Lord's will and he wants to bring parts two, three, and four, then we will do that. Only if that's his will. If not, then I will present the message as it is today. And I believe in my heart that that would be sufficient if the Lord says, no, let number one, let part one stand on its own. Now, uh, as I said, that, you know, hypocrisy or the imbalance of power is a violation of the principle of God individual autonomy. That is God and individual autonomy. So if you go back into the book of Genesis, you will see that God created Adam and, and in God laying out his mandate for the earth, that God's intention was, was that the earth would be a reflection of heaven. As God ruled and reigned in heaven, so would man rule and reign on the earth. But man would not rule over other men. And when I say men, I'm talking about people, women, and, you know, that there would not be this, uh, this lordship of one human being over another. And so, therefore... When balance becomes, when power becomes imbalanced, then it creates the God slash individual autonomous relationship or even principle. Because God's intention of his heart and his intentions have not changed, but the intentions of his heart is that every individual would have such an intimate relationship with him that they would not need to be governed by another human being, but they would be led by the spirit. That is the, the pure desire of God's heart as he revealed to us in Genesis. And it manifests in every aspect of society or of existence, I should say, that, you know, that when you look at you know, the physical realm, the spiritual realm, you look at the uh, waterways, you look at nature itself, then when you start to step back and look at these things, that a lot of these things are not governed in and of themselves. 
And if you remove the aspect that sin brought into these various dimensions on the earth and uh, just allow them to function without the, the plague of sin upon them, then you will see how, you know, the, the trees don't need to be governed. The animals, they, you know, the birds sing. They know when to get up. They know when to roost and to go to sleep. You know, the water knows how to flow downhill and how to cut new paths. It doesn't have to be governed. And, and man was created, human beings were created to operate in this balance of power, whereas God is the sovereign God and human beings have the right to operate as they are led by the spirit of the Lord. Even the scriptures support that by saying that, you know, a pastor cannot work out your soul's salvation and neither can your parents or your children or your caretaker or guardian or the supervisor on your job. No one can work out your, your uh, salvation but you. That's because God has still in his heart the autonomy that he desires for each individual to have, particularly when they're in right relationship with him, when they're able to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and when their heart is soft and compassionate toward the will of God and desires to obey God. And uh, even the world itself knows that, you know, there has to be a balance of power. Uh, the world, though, sees it sort of in a different light than what I'm talking about now, because the world would say uh, that the balance of power is, is obvious, because if a person was in a fight or a gunfight, then the world would say that you never bring a knife to a gunfight because of the balance of power. Even the law, as I understand it, states that uh, you can't use overwhelming force even for someone who's trespassing on your property. So, you know, and, and the balance of power, it says, or the, the ideal of it is that when a person comes on your property, then if they're not a threat, you can't not use lethal force against that individual just because they're on your property. You know, it's a balance of power. It says that as things escalate, then the force that's needed escalates. So you use, you balance power out. All right. I pray that, you know, the Holy Spirit will make this plain. All right. So as power is out of balance, then it creates difficulty in the lives of individuals. It, it uh, increases uh, woes in families. It increases woes in communities. It increases woes in society when balance, when power is out of balance. And you'll notice that as, you know, couples that you respect and you hold in high regard, you know, whether they had this blessing from the beginning or they learned it over time, that they learned that mature covenant relationships require the balancing of power. Now, power can be manifested in a lot of different ways because everyone is born with uh, the power that they receive from God. For instance, uh, you know, when a couple has been trying to conceive a child, and, and they finally conceive a child, then that child, when it comes through the womb and into this world, it brings forth a power of joy with it. It brings forth a gift of joy to the hearts of those parents that they could not have known had that child not been born. And as they raise that child in honor of God, then they learn to operate with that child and raise that child up in an environment of love and support. And in an environment of love support, you don't need a lot of rules, you don't need a lot of regulations that, you know, you, you teach the child the right from wrong, you teach the child how to do things in a way that's appropriate, even if the desires of the heart uh, may be not necessarily in perfect alignment with the mores or the morals of society, that the parent just slowly nudges the child into that way when it's an environment of love. But when you have an environment 
where power is not balanced, then you'll see a lot of rules and regulations in that environment, whether it's in a home, whether it's in a church, or in a job, you know, wherever you see a lot of rules and regulations being laid upon the people, then you know that there's an indication or that in itself is an indication that the powers are getting out of balance. So therefore, the balance of power is a blessing. Even in the ministry itself, that the Lord, when he calls an individual to ministry, you know, when God called Moses to lead Israel, that it was not Moses who called himself, but still there had to be a balance of power. Even his son, his, his brother, Aaron, had to become his mouthpiece. And you understand that, you know, that God creates this balance of power so that we all learn to honor and respect one another as well as learn to love and respect and honor ourselves. I trust that the Lord is going to make this plain as we continue to go on through the message. Now think of it for a moment. Uh, most of you would say that, you know, well, you know, who are the, 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 the pastors at Castlewood Christian Ministry? Like if you looked on the documentation and, and you know, and well, no, not the documentation because the legal documentation has all of our names on it. But if you look at it, you know, the world would say, oh, well, who is the senior pastor? But the balance of power, the way that God operates is that God says, I send them out two by two. And I sort of hinted at this last Sunday. But as Pastor David, Pastors David and Beverly are one, and Mama Oya and I are one, then we're like two individuals and God brings balance to this ministry. You know, Pastor David and I became the best of friends many years ago. And, and, and although I'm using a real live example that you have to understand that it's the principle that governs this, this balance of power is a principle. And when you want to walk uprightly with God, then God will bring you into the balance where uh, power is balanced because when power is out of balance, then it just wreaks havoc. And one of the things that, um, and I'm going to get back to pastors David and Beverly, but one of the things that the Lord revealed to us, because he's always teaching us, that he's given us examples in ministry where po uh, power was not balanced and what it produced and ministerial examples of when power is balanced and what it produces. So any situation when there's a balance of power, then you'll see respect, you'll see the honoring of uh, opinions, you will, you will see the honoring of individual experiences, and you will see the honoring of everyone brings something to the table. Now, it may not necessarily mean that every time you offer an opinion to us, that we will be able to use it, but we will at least give you the respect of listening to it and taking it before the Lord to see what the Lord has to say. But when Pastor David and I became the best of friends, it wasn't something that we purposed. It was just something that, you know, came together because the, the Lord was working uh, not just for that moment, the benefit of, you know, two brothers coming together and being the best of friends in that moment, but the Lord was joining two hearts for the kingdom of God and for the long term. So over time, pastors David and I, you know, would talk in fellowship. Our bond grew stronger. And then, you know, our wives got involved and, and we all became one with each other. But one of the benefits and the illustrations that I often think about when I think about pastors David and Beverly that I love the fact that they are the balance or the counterbalance and we are like the counterbalance to them like brother David one of the things that I, I, I love and honor about him is his love for his family 
And if you don't grow up in a family where, you know, there was a balance of power and, and, and you don't have an example in your heart of what uh, a loving environment would be like, because, you know, I came from a loving environment. Let me make that clear. But there were dysfunctional behaviors. And, and when you uh, come up, you imitate the good and the bad of your environment. And so therefore, you have failures in your relationships or failures in your life because God is saying that it's a violation of principle. And what I need to do is not just heal your body and heal your emotions, but I need to heal the, the uh, understanding of principles. And this principle of the balance of power will get rid of a lot of woes that are in our lives. <clears throat> so when Pastor David and I became dear friends, not only did I recognize the fact that he loved his wife, that he was committed to her, he was committed to, you know, having fidelity in the relationship, faithfulness to one another, but to love his children in a way that his children had the autonomy or, or space around them to develop their own personalities, their own character, their own likes, you know, without a lot of rules and regulations from the parents. Now, the parents provided the light and the protection. And, and it was a witness to me because when I saw that, it was a manifestation of God's kingdom. And God's kingdom will manifest in a lot of ways that are not religious, but they will catch your eye because you will see that that is God in operation. And where God is in operation, that is his domain. That is his kingdom. So I, 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 I watched Brother David, and, and that's when I started to notice that my heart so yearned to create what he created in his household, what he and Pastor Beverly created in his household, that I just started following him around, just like a little kid, you know. And I mean, you know, not a simpleton way, but I followed him around because my heart yearned and thirsted to understand the principles that was governing his life and how that manifested. You know, how does it, you know, what's the attitude that goes along with it? How, what's the thinking pattern? You know, how do you deal with conflicts or things that threaten those things? You know, the subtle things. So I will you know, just follow in his footsteps and watch him and observe him. And there were a lot of things that I learned and observed in that time that the Lord had me just kind of, you know, us walking together as brothers. And I don't even know if he realized that I was following it, but I was. But one of the things that I think is a primary gift that Pastor David bring, you know, to life, bring to ministry, bring to relationships, bring to the culture, the community, the society at large, is uh, the ability to listen and the uh, connectedness with the spirit of wisdom. And so therefore, when the Lord started this ministry, that the Lord understands that ministry has a lot to do, has a great influence over the eternal life of individuals. You know, as people work out their own soul salvation, they are influenced by the leaders that are in their lives, particularly in the area of spirituality, Christian, Christ, Christian, uh, the Christian faith or the kingdom of God. They are influenced by not only the leaders, but the people who create that environment or who create that family. And as a result, the Lord will assign people in leadership that balance each other for the protection, not only of the individuals who have taken on that mantle, but for the protection of the people that the Lord will bring into that because words can uh, aim a person's life, give them direction, and, and words can also become daggers that create harm and, and deep injury and alienation, whereas, you know, and, and you see a lot of people um, see hypocrisy in the church. And so therefore they run from it. 
But what they don't understand is that they're running from the organization and not necessarily running from the spirit. So when the spirit comes into an organization, then the organization wants to have its rule, regulations, mandates, its you know, doctrines, its traditions, and all of that. that. Organizations love those sort of things. It's hierarchy of power. But when the spirit of the Lord comes in, the spirit of the Lord says, that's not how the kingdom of God works, even in an organization. That the Lord says that the greater power you have or influence, not power, but the greater influence you have <clears throat> in the kingdom of God, then the more that power and that influence will humble you in a position of a servant. You will find that, you know, Jesus Christ, when you really study his life <clears throat> and get to the truth of his life, you'll find that Jesus didn't exalt himself as a king. He didn't exalt himself as God. He did acknowledge it, but he presented himself as a humble servant, especially in light of where he came from before coming to earth. And in like fashion, whenever there's an anointing in operation, that you will see that the anointing of the Lord humbles the human soul and it creates the ability to listen. It creates the ability to not just hear the words that a person is speaking, but to even hear and discern the message that's coming forth out of that person's heart. And so therefore that wisdom allows you to, you know, put your brain in, in, in the mode where it hears, but it doesn't become the dominant voice at the table of decision-making that the heart steps up, the spirit of the Lord steps up and it receives the message that is articulated from the heart. And God says, he says, you know, man is impressed by the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. He listens to the heart. He listens, hears the words of our prayers, but even more, he hears the yearning and the cry, the inaudible communications of our heart. So the Lord uh, knew that that's a critical factor in having a healthy family. And so as I would walk and, and you know, observe Pastor David and, and then Pastor Beverly and then I start to, you know, get to know their children and, you know, the children weren't married at that time and didn't have, you know, children of their own. But I would watch and I would observe and I would see how the word started to appear when it got off the page and it took on two feet. And this was critical for me because God knew that he had called me to leadership. And, and when I say me, I'm talking about Mama Oya as well, that he called us to leadership and that he had to heal certain things, you know, because uh, when, you, when you come in with the world's way, uh, the world is all about power. If they get a revelation, they use it for their advantage to gain more power. You know, they say knowledge is power, money is power, you know, the possessions, the bigger houses, you know, to the more flamboyant you are with expensive clothes. It's all about who has the power and how the power is used. And so in this world, there is an imbalance of power and God has to rectify that because it's so woven into us. It's so woven even to those of us who declare that we are Christians and that, you know, we'll walk in the way of the Lord, that we're, that when it comes down to challenging uh, the powers, then we easily become envious of one another and start to compete with one another. And next thing you know, that one law starts, you know, get a little hairline fracture in it or, uh, or get a, a, a split and not realizing that that split with, uh, will be widened over time through institutionalism and, and man's traditions because we start now, when we start to uh, compete for power, then we take our eyes off of God and we put our eyes on the ones who possess the power. And then next thing you know, you come up with philosophies where, well, anybody, you know, uh, everybody has a price. And that's not true. See, in the kingdom of God, it's not true. You know, uh, in, 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 in the world, it says, well, that every man is a dog. And see, in the kingdom of God, that is not true. 
in the world, even the scripture says this, that the eyes of a man cannot be satisfied. But in the kingdom of God, it is not true. Sometimes the scripture will tell you worldly truths so that you are aware of them and you know how to mitigate or deal with that in a way. And, and, but it's not necessarily stating that's how things are. You know, because uh, if you uh, study Solomon, King Solomon, who was the wisest man in the world, you know, some of his teachings will cause you to be, you know, very sad and de depressed because you'll say, you know, it's, it's all there is. You know, everything that, that is has been. Everything that's created has already been created. This, you know, you know, we might as well go ahead and take a drink and party because tomorrow we die. And, and so many people, you know, have been convinced that that is not only an earthly truth, but an eternal truth, a spiritual truth. But it's not. So God uh, desires for us to, you know, have um, or to open our hearts for the revelation, for uh, the Holy Spirit to come in and not just mythically, you know, uh, or mystically come into our hearts, but the Holy Spirit to even come in through companion relationships that he will bring into our lives, godly relationships that will bring the light and the understanding of, you know, how love functions, how principles work, you know, how to be courteous, how to control your tongue, how to bring yourself in subjection. See, because all of that is the phase of the cross where the Lord is, is uh, causing us or helping us to choose death so that we may find life. And he brings this, he starts to bring the power of influence, the power of uh, love, the power of wisdom, the power of understanding. He starts to bring that so that it starts to, you know, all of these other things that we learned in the world, it starts to uh, balance, counterbalance that. And, and so therefore, the balance of power and understanding the principle of it becomes very critical for the church as we proceed because see everyone is born with assets and everyone is born with needs and in the kingdom of god my needs may complement your assets and your assets may complement my needs or your needs may complement my assets so you know what do i mean by that that the balance of power, it doesn't create a goal of dependency or independency. The balance of power understands that everyone has autonomy. Everyone has a God-given authority. Everyone has a degree of power. And when we join that power together, then that power increases exponentially. So the adversary to the to the human spirit and to the kingdom of God within tries to create division and an imbalance of power. But the balance of power produces interdependency. Whereas in the world, you know, if a person says, well, I don't trust anybody, I never love anybody, and I'm just an independent, independent person, I'm a free spirit, and I just kind of do whatever it is that I want to do. Uh, you know, without regard to anything. See, that's not the autonomy that God is talking about in the God-individual relationship or that principle. See, when a person walks with God, then the person has God's heart. That's one of the first things that God starts to transform is the heart because the heart is where all the issues of life, all the decisions, all the values, everything is taken into the heart and weighed and given uh, a certain degree of priority and place in one's life. So when God starts to heal the heart, then one starts to understand that, you know, that I love God and I want to please God. And God says, fine. He says that if you really want to please me, now love your brothers and your sisters because there are things about me that you may not necessarily like, but you will work those out with the people that you work with. 
you know, and, and, and people say, well, how can that be? Well, if you look at the relationship between God and Israel, you'll see that Israel had a lot of arts with God. There was a time when God was there, you know, he was their king and they wanted a human king. You know, there were times when uh, God says, you know, don't take idols and, and bring those things into your life because they'll lead you astray. And, and God, unlike a man, you know, you go and take a high, uh, idol and hide it in your tent or under a blanket, then God sees that and he knows how by the spirit to lead somebody to bring it in. And when he unveils that, and you can read this in the Old Testament yourself, that when he unveils that, it looks like God punishes the person who moves in this violation. And, and it's not necessarily God who's doing the punishing, as much as God in his holiness and in his sovereignty, he has created principles like guardians that govern through this earth. You know, there are principles that govern every aspect of this earth and the principles carry within themselves blessings and consequences, blessings and consequences. So therefore, when someone, you know, in the tribe of Israel, when God narrowed it down to, you know, a particular tribe, then a particular household, then a particular tent. And then within that tent, there was, a, a, there was a, a, an idol buried there. And because it was a violation of God's word, then that principle automatically, you know, the, the principle brought forth without any, you know, prejudice. Uh, it was completely objective that the principle brought forth the consequence. And as a result, the story that I'm referencing the person died. And, and so therefore, when God uh, implements principles in this world, he will bring individuals who will be your teachers, individuals who will be your companions to walk with you. Because, you know, if you are a person given to social media, you'll see that there are a lot of people with, you know, trauma on, still on the inside. The, the outside, they may look good. They may have a successful career. They may have, uh, you know, a good bit of money. They may have a degree of influence. But if you look at their relationships, their relationships are a wreck because, you know, the intimate relationships in your life are like your thermometer that they can tell, you know, kind of where you are on the scheme of things. And and it's these principles that we have to learn that we can't necessarily find in a self-help book, but God will reveal those as a revelation as we walk in the places that he has called us to walk and when we walk with the people whom he has called us to walk with because he's bringing the power into balance. Just like the woundedness of the soul has a degree of power to create fear and anxiety and, and, you know, instability in our mental uh, facilities and all that God, you know, and we pray, God, heal me, deliver me from this. And God can deliver you. He can remove the adversarial spirits. He can, uh, you know, bring forth, uh, you know, the, the healing that you prayed for. But if you don't know how to manifest that healing, you know, if you don't know how to walk in that healthy relationship, if you don't know how to quell that anger or quiet that anger, if you don't know how to listen attentively with the idea to understand, see, if you don't know how to recognize wisdom when it's speaking to you, then you need, you know, either like a brother or a parent to come so that as God's divine will is coming and he's bringing forth that balance of power that he will bring forth relationships. But see, in, in America and in Western culture, we honor individual uh, autonomy in an ungodly way because in America and in the Western world, see, our, uh, our idea is, is that I can, you know, I do have autonomy and, and you all embrace that aspect of the message, but you have to also embrace the other part and that is that my autonomy is in my relationship with God learning to walk in God's will, to learn to walk in God's holiness, to learn to listen to, because see God, whatever you desire in your heart, God desires even more. He, he magnifies it because what he desires for you is perf, uh, perfection, 
not for you to be perfect, but he has a perfect love for you. He has perfect gifts and callings for you. He has perfect friendships. He has a perfect relationship. And it won't be a perfect relationship, but it will be perfect for you. You know, he will put the people in your life that are perfect for you when you walk in that relationship. But see, in the Western world, we desire to have the autonomy, but without God. And so therefore, we like to do our own thing and lean on our own understanding and make our own decisions. And we only acknowledge ourselves. And, and God says, no, 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 you bring forth consequences on yourself. So if you look at social media, you'll see that, you know, there are a lot of us, a lot of people in the Western culture, and maybe in other cultures, but definitely in Western civilization where we have all this advancement and technology, where we are so out of balance in terms of, you know, power and understanding how the kingdom of God within us, the Christ within us, how it's in alignment with the kingdom of God, but yet we have not surrendered or, or learned to honor that, you know, and so therefore we walk in our hurts, you know, we'll walk in our fears and just like we put on nice clothes and suits and makeup and, you know, extensions and all these things that we do to enhance our outer appearance, that we do those things so, you know, to cover up a lot of the pain that we have on the inside and we wonder why God doesn't deliver us or why God has not, you know, healed us or, or why God has not, you know, because his word said, by Jesus stripes, I'm healed. And, and you are healed already in the spirit, but you can't act out that healing because of the imbalance of power. See, it's not a, it's not a uh, infirmity issue. It's an issue of not being in alignment with God's power because, see, the imbalance of power creates the woes. It creates the woes of life. But the balance of power allows revelation to come forth or allows healing to come. And God knows every need of your heart even before it's released. And he brings that. And, 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 and you'll see this, that uh, when people don't have a peace of mind, when people don't have a peace in their heart, when, you know, and particularly people who walk with God, when, when people have to project on other people and victimize other people and, you know, put down other people or degrade or devalue other people, whenever you see that, then you know that inside that person, within that person, the content of their heart is this imbalance of power because the imbalance of power and understanding creates a woe in that person's heart, which manifests as woes in life. And God wants to heal that. He, he wants to heal that because, see, this nation, like that tree that has been divided, that, that tree that has been, you know, that has that splinter and it's going to get wider and wider and wider. If we try to address it with policy and, and you know, and, and, uh, and rules and legislation and all of that, but not understanding the spiritual parts of it. And when we begin to understand the spiritual part of it, then we'll start addressing a lot of these natural uh, issues with natural causes and natural solutions. But if we don't address the spiritual part of it, the part that the Lord has revealed to us, if we don't bring that, then it's only going to repeat and uh, the situation is going to repeat and, and get worse over time or, or, or increase as generations go by. I pray, I pray that you hear me by the Spirit because uh, you have to address the core of an issue and, and because, let me say this, just as an example to, to help bring some clarity of what I'm uh, trying to say by the Spirit. You know, there was a time when uh, God created man and woman and they were equal in the garden. But when sin came in, then as a consequence of sin, there became an imbalance of power. And out of that imbalance of power, you still see the consequences in the male-female relationship today. We still see the inequity of pay. We still see the inequity, you know, like when a man comes, if, if a man and a woman and, and the woman has the authority and the man is her subordinate, well, you can walk into an environment and oftentimes they will address the man as though he is the one with the, uh, the higher rank 
and talk to the woman as though she's, you know, the one who's uh, of a lower rate, unsubordinate. Or, you know, if, uh, if, if uh, you know, uh, uh, you go into a plane and you see a, a man and a woman dressed in a uniform, then you'll probably think that the woman is the flight attendant and the man is the pilot. And it could be just the reverse. And see, those are just real simple examples of what I'm uh, attempting to say by the Spirit. And, and we have tried through regulation, we've tried through all sorts of things, preaching and all, in order to uh, rectify these problems and correct these issues. But see, they can only be corrected in the Spirit. They will never be corrected by us laying another law you know, another procedure, another piece of legislation on top. That's good because it can only regulate behavior, but it cannot regulate the morality or the moral values of one's heart. So that comes when you walk in godly relationships uh, with each other and with God. And so therefore in the Western world, so many uh, people who are assigned to churches, you know, are assigned to a, a, a spiritual family, they will go and seek, you know, places over here and, and over there. And, and you know, and, and they realize, they say, well, I want to get this revelation. I want to get that revelation. I want to get that revelation. And God said, no. He says, when you're in right standing with me, that the blessings will pursue you and overtake you because my purpose for you will call forth the revelation. It will cause forth the resources. It will call forth the relationships. It will call forth everything you need because the Lord says, I know what you have need of even before you ask. So, but, so he says, find what my will is. And, and, and you, you know, you'll see trees don't run around. You know, they're planted and, and they produce the oxygen that's in the earth. They're vital to our survival. And, and saints of God, whether they are Christian saints of God or, or saints of God that of another faith, or saints of God who don't even declare faith, but they're still saints of God because they can hear the spirit of the Lord. Abraham uh, was not a Christian and he wasn't a Jew or, or, or a religious person, but Abraham heard the spirit of the Lord and he was a saint of God. So saints of God are not defined by their religion, but they're defined by their heart sensitivity to God's heart. So when saints of God are, are called forth in this earth, they're called forth to bring forth a truth uh, into the world and bring a light into the world and bring forth understanding into the world that will start to cause the imbalances or the, the inequities of the worldly system to crumble. And, and they crumble because, see, you know, so many times, and this, this has happened in, in the church, that a, great, a grave error, I believe, in the church it's where the church start preaching about individual sins. See, uh, to preach about individual sin is really just to be preaching darkness to darkness. That if you want, if you want uh, to see a person, uh, you know, delivered and healed from their sin, then live the life in front of them in the light. Live the life that you proclaim that you are preaching to them that you want them to have. Live that life in such an authentic way that the light of your example and the light of the pure love in your heart and the light of the regard will reveal to them God that they can't see. And when the God that they can't see manifests through you, then it will become an evidence for them that uh, of the truth of God. And next thing you know, like a little puppy, they start following you. You may not even know that they're following you, but they may follow you on Facebook. They may follow you on Instagram. They may follow you on YouTube. They may, you know, just want to have dinner with you from time to time because they are gleaming these things. But see, the way things are now, you know, we are running to hither and yon and, and not realizing that in our heart we are seeking God. And God is saying, no, be still and know that I'm God and I will bring forth those things that I desire for you. And um, uh, so, so I, pray, I pray that you hear me by the Spirit because, you know, I'm still in the introduction of the message and I may just, you know, do the introduction uh, today and, and if the Lord wills, then go on. And as I said earlier, 
that the message that the Lord has put in my heart about this is so deep that he was showing me what Jesus has seen, you know, in the earth. And, and, and it can be revealed through the scriptures, what Jesus has seen that, you know, and, 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 and when we start to see as Jesus sees, then he will reveal things to us. But God didn't say, you know, for us to take our autonomy and detach ourselves from him. And then we start doing our own thing and we call that God's will. Well, you know, God's will will always be uh, accompanied with peace. And it will not be a peace that the world can take. Worldly circumstances can't disrupt that peace. But then when we step out of the peace or when we're not at peace, then that becomes like a pain in our spirit, like pain is to our body. It's a warning to let us know, pay attention because maybe something in this area needs to address. So, you know, we don't have this peace and instead of being still and knowing God and allowing the Holy Spirit to come and to minister to us where we are, find us right where we are to bring forth the balance of power or the balance of understanding or the balance of love or whatever is out of balance that he wants to bring that thing into balance so that when he comes forth, you know, to us, he's not like, uh, you know, God walking through the garden and saying, you know, Adam, where are you? You know, well, I hid, you know, and, and, and so oftentimes when we run, you know, from one place to the other, it's because we're afraid of intimacy and we're afraid of people who start to get so close that they start to be able to look in those places in our heart and see where those injuries are in our heart. And we said, no, you know, I can't go there. So, you know, so we'll stop going to the church or we'll stop attending that ministry and we start running around over here and we, we, we get a lot of mileage, but we aren't producing anything, you know? And you see so many people today with religion and a religious understanding and, you know, and, and quoting scripture and all of that, you know, but they don't have an understanding of the spirit and they were, they will call you alive if you told them that. They said, no, because we're so indoctrinated that we have to defend ourselves. And the Lord said, you don't have to defend yourself. I'm your defense. He said, I'm your shield and buckler, you know, and, and the truth will defend itself. But the truth that we know, you know, will not necessarily set us free. It's the truth that God reveals to us that will set us free from all this heartache and this pain and this need to run around. See, some of us just need to settle down and let the, the, the dust settle, let the muddy water settle and clear up and just sit there and be still and know that he is God. And when it's time, then the Lord will send forth a word and it will not just be a word, but it will be a word of confirmation because it will come to you first and you will know but then the Lord will send forth a, a undeniable confirmation of that word and, and, uh, and get it back to Pastor David. One time, uh, Mama Oya and I, we were uh, serving communion at, a, at the church where we belonged to. And Pastor David, he was in security at that time. And, and he would stand up on the pulpit, which gave him oversight of the whole congregation. And he came up to us and he said this, and this was the spirit of the Lord. He said that the Lord has called you to. And, and I was so grateful for that because, you know, uh, I had been in ministry before, had been ordained minister and all of that sort of thing. And if he had walked up and said, you know what, Brother Wendell, the Lord has called you, then that in itself, because it would have appealed to my ego in the sense that when the ministry starts to take off or people start to come and things start to happen, then, you know, there would be the temptation of looking at myself. And God knew that. So God said to Pastor David, he said, I called both of them. And so therefore, and, and he sent a strong woman <laughs> to walk with me. Mama Oya, you know, she's gentle. She's uh, uh, very elegant. You know, she's very intelligent. You know, she's, she knows how to walk by the spirit. You know, she's not given to, you know, just hysterics and, and, and you know, and, and different moods and all that sort of thing. She's real stable, but she's tough. She's like Teflon tough. And wherever I walk, because I, I believe I have an adventurous spirit, 
and, and that comes with assets and liabilities. And, 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 you know, and the things that, you know, when you are of a certain character or personality type, it's so easy for you to grab hold of the glory for yourself or to hunger for the glory for yourself. And we've seen that. We've seen that in, in people who um, were couples and, and we sat in on a meeting once and I don't need to give the demographics or who was there and all, but there was a young couple there. They were pastoring a church or, or pretty much he was pastoring a church and, and you know, she was the first lady, but she was also the, really the shepherd of the church, but he couldn't acknowledge her part. You know, he couldn't acknowledge because we were ha having a talk at the table and suggesting that both of them proceed in ordination together. And, and, and he couldn't hear it. And, and later on, it uh, affected the whole church in a way that I don't need to go into. But balance becomes so important because when God sends us to a place, whether he plants us at a church or plants us in a relationship, you know, when it's of God, then it will bring forth a balance. And that balance, when, it's, when it has its work done, that balance will start to rebuke those woes of hypocrisy. You know, it will help us to take off the mask. You know, we don't have to worry about what people think about us or how people feel about us or how a person looked at us. And, you know, and we want to have an attitude because they looked at us a certain way. See, when the, when the balance of power comes into play in, in one's heart, when God starts to bring forth that, then that alignment, that proper alignment, see, and, and it's so critical to understand because, see, the balance of power requires the, the God portion and the human portion. So God says, love me with all your heart, but then he says, love your brother as yourself because the equation can't work if you just love me but don't love your brother, or if you love your brother and you don't love me. He says, in order to bring that equation to work, to bring in that balance, then you have to love both because I'm going to approach you and I'm going to give you revelation and I'm going to heal you through both. And some people say, well, you know, I'm just going to pray over this headache that I have and I'm not going to take any medication. God said, no, there's a balance of power that I have given the power to the pharmacist that when you take the right dosage for the right reasons and, and, you know, according to the prescription, then I have given the authority for that thing to work. And now I have the spirit that will rebuke the infirmity and I have the medication that will bring forth the natural healing and it all works because it's a balance of power. See, it happens in relationships. It happens in revelation. It happens in church. It happens, uh, you know, throughout and, and so many times we go about rebuking the devil or Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You know, let me tell you this about rebuking the devil. Because so, so many people, you know, think that they can rebuke the devil and all. That Jesus did not rebuke the devil uh, per se. He allowed the word of God to rebuke the devil. He allowed, I mean, and, and the angel Gabriel, he didn't uh, rebuke the devil when he was arguing over the Moses of body. He, uh, over Moses' physical body when Moses had died. He let the word of God rebuke him because, see, the devil, no matter what you think about him, you know, the adversary uh, of, of the kingdom of God, well, no matter what you think about him, is that he's still a creation of God. He has walked as Lucifer in the holy places that we have yet to see. You know, he has uh, sat at the feet of God and has wisdom and knowledge and understanding of the ages. And, and we're trying to gain this stuff. And so we go around rebuking and, and, and all of that when it would be so much easier to ask the Lord to give us a heart that's sensitive to his will and ask the Lord to give us a spirit of revelation and a spirit of understanding. Because when you come in balance, when that obedience, you know, start to cast out disobedience, when faith start to cast out fear, you know, when love starts to deal with fear, when, when forgiveness start to overcome unforgiveness and that balance start to come in our life, then all of a sudden that, that tree, like in the United States, you know, the division that we have, we have everything that we need to bring forth a healing in the split in this nation 
but it won't come if we don't have the understanding. And right now, we, we are lacking understanding, and God's people perish for a lack of knowledge. So, you know, there, there's so much more that I want to say. I just want to make certain that I, I, I haven't left out any significant points because, I mean, you know, I got scripture that I want to give to you, but today is a communion Sunday, and, and I want to be prudent in my wisdom and understanding and, and let this stand as an introduction. And if it's God's will, then uh, we'll come back next Sunday and we'll delve more into this message because there's so much more to it. You know, the things that God wants us to see, you know, the, the, the uh, understanding authority, understanding how to restore the streets and repair the, bre the breaches. And, you know, it, there's so much that he wants us to understand <clears throat> but sometimes devastation has to come or darkness has to come and manifest itself before you really appreciate the light. Like, you, you know, like when, you, <clears throat> when you're privileged and then, uh, you know, you don't know what hunger is. And so, therefore, when someone sets something in front of you to eat, then you be real picky and say, what's this? You know, well, I don't like that. And, and, you know, you're not even paying for the meal. They paying for the meal. They prepared the meal and they're serving it. And the Lord, when he sent out his servants into the world as lambs who will become lions later on, just like the lion of Judah, that when he sent them out as lambs, he said, don't take out any money. Don't take any extra clothes, no uh, pair of shoes. He says, wherever you go, if peace, if my peace abides in that home, if that my balance of power abides in that home and it, and it has the peace, then add your peace with it. And then when you sit down to eat, whatever they put in front of you, he said, eat that. So, you know, and, and, and when you are hungry, when you are hungry, then whatever a person sits before you, if it's as healthy, whether it's to your liking or not, you will be thankful for it from your heart and, and that balance, the appreciation and the hunger. See, the hunger was something we try to avoid. And so, but it was the hunger that made you appreciate that this was a gift of God that was served to you. And, and so now we, we become less judgmental. But in our blessings and, and overabundance, and you, know, and, and you know how we preach that prosperity, uh, you know how the preachers did for a season, you know, the prosperity gospel and said, you know, money cometh and God called you to live life and life more abundantly. See, it was preached with a lack of understanding because now we have, we are all living an abundant life and we have more high blood pressure, more diabetes, we have more kidney issues, you know, more uh, infirmities. And it's not because our bodies have a spirit of infirmity, but because our abundance, our understanding of abundance and the permission that it gave us created an imbalance. And so now we're walking around with heart disease because, you know, we're much overweight and, and we, you know, we're too lazy to exercise and we want convenience. And so now the marketplace, the worldly system says, okay, well, I'm going to create fast food. It's going to be high in flavor, low in nutrition, and, 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 and really high in fat. It's going to clog your arteries and, and create more heart attacks and all that sort of thing. But at least you will die content with the flavor of your food. And you see how out of balance that gets, how the balance of, of, of influence that this worldly system has. And, and, uh, and, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to a, a close almost in, in a second. I just want to share uh, one other point with you. That Jesus said that he came to destroy the works of the devil. And, and, and so, you know, and we oftentimes we'll go around rebuking the devil, you know, like we're destroying the works of the devil. And see, the works of the devil aren't necessarily what you think that they are. See, the systemic imbalance that produces racism, that produces sexism, that produces, you know, the byproduct of capitalism. You know, I lift myself up by my bootstraps. And, and if you were just as talented as I am, then you would be lifting yourself up by your bootstraps too. And God said, no, it's a systemic issue. See, see that's, a, that's a byproduct of the work that God... See, See, Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. And so now the devil 
don't have the autonomy to, to intervene in things that, the way he used to. However, the system that is created through religion, and I'm talking about all religions, even Christianity, through religion, through capitalism, through worldly governments, no matter whether they're socialistic or capitalistic or whatever, that all worldly systems create an imbalance. And so now, as God created, as Jesus destroyed the works of the devil, now it behooves us to start to see the byproducts of this work and start to address those things and bring those things into proper order. And so that's why I started off and say, you know, that when you start preaching against people, you know, uh, you know, then, you know, if a person, let's say if there's a particular issue that you take, you know, that you see on television, you take art with that. Be real careful that you don't start victimizing people because it's self-righteousness that thinks that you're pointing your finger at, but then the righteousness in that fist is saying that these three fingers are pointing back at you because they're likely for every one issue that you take an art with, there are probably three issues that God has taken art with you. And he said, be careful because I know everything about everybody. And when you start judging this person, then I'm gonna, I can, re you are releasing judgment upon yourself. And, and, it, and it becomes very critical that we understand, particularly as we like to celebrate the new year and enter into a new uh, uh, a period of time, that we don't go back and put uh, different paint on the same old problem and call it something different when it's really just a repeat of the same old behavior. That the Lord wants us to have understanding. So therefore, when we see that any person is suffering, you know, whether it's uh, they're being discriminated against because of their sexual orientation or discriminated against because of their race, discriminated against because of their sex, discriminated against because of their religious preference, whether it's, you know, that Muslim or whatever. See, all religions fit within this world. No religion can take you into the kingdom of God. But God can bring Christ Jesus into every religion and he doesn't have to get your approval or my approval and say, well, you know, are you saying the name of Jesus? That's my understanding of the Bible. God said, hey, lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge me and I will give you a revelation of what I'm doing over there. So, so and, and out of our worldly religious systems, we join our power with the worldly systems and, and God says, he starts to reveal to us that it's not the people that the problems are with because at the judgment seat, it's the nations, governments that are creating these problems. And if you study the governments, then you'll find out that it's the government, whenever you have chaos in any area, you know, like they say, follow the money, Follow the cause and don't get distracted and you'll see that it leads to the government, to these institutions, these worldly institutions that have been created that, that uh, build upon the divisions of people because if the people were on one accord, they will overthrow a lot of these worldly governments and a lot of these worldly religions and a lot of this hypocrisy and they would do better without them if they knew the truth. But because we have the spirit of fear in us more than faith and we have the, uh, the spirit of fear in us more than we have the spirit of love, then we like to have these institutions, you know, that, are, that, are, that come up with laws like stand your ground so that if you feel threatened, you can shoot somebody, you know, or if you or, or if uh, if, you know, you're walking your dog and someone is birding. You know, and, and then, you know, and they say, well, put your dog on the leash. Then you feel like you're entitled that you can call the police and say, well, I got this man that's staring at me and he's a threat. He's threatening me and, and all that. See, see, both of those people are potential victims, but one had the light and he said, well, call the police, you know, call them, call them. And, and that's how people of light do. They know how to deal with that imbalance and they don't take it personally and they don't attack for attack. You know, they don't they don't throw uh, chaos or evil for evil, but they answer evil with good. They answer harsh uh, rhetoric with soft answers. 
They don't necessarily go up and pick a fight, you know, and see who's going to be the one that comes out on top, one who has the fewer broken bones and, and bleeding nose and all. See, that's not how the kingdom of God works. But if the church is going to mature, we have to learn how to start understanding, not just being able to quote the scripture and all of that, but to, to look at the word and open it up as a treasure chest and allow the Holy Spirit to bring forth revelation. And because the, the, the revelational knowledge that we know, our truth that we know, will set us free. All right. So, so church, I'm, I'm just going to pause there. There's so much more that I want to say. You know, that's, that is just the introduction. And if it's the Lord's will, only if it's the Lord's will, then we will start to get into the message next Sunday. Only if that's his will. Because, you know, at this point, if we aren't doing his will, then this is nothing but a show and nothing but organized religion. So, and just another worldly system. So I pray that the Lord will bring forth the revelation on this imbalance of power that is so prevalent and without us even recognizing what's going on, that he start to bring it so that we can stop adding to the problem and start bringing forth solutions. And the solution always begins with love and empathy and caring for people. So I pray that you heard me and, and, and I pray that, you know, if the Lord you know, on your job or your neighbor sends a Muslim next door, you won't start thinking terrorists, you know, but that you'll start, that you'll look at a human being and that when you look at a human being that you'll look for Christ in that person's heart because the Lord says what we seek we'll find. And so if we look through the eyes and lenses of propaganda, then the propaganda will tell us what it is that we see and what we're seeking in that person when a person comes in. And so they say, you prejudge them, prejudice. You know, so now when a person walks in, you have prejudged or your prejudice lens have now only allowed you to see in that person what you ascribe to them rather than what's true. And see, God so loved the world, you know, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should have everlasting life. You know, and, 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 and God, his reign comes down on the just and the unjust. You know, God's blessings come down on light and darkness. Light, I mean, darkness is light to God. So, you know, if you really want to understand God, if you really want to progress forward in 2021, then pause where you are. Ask the Lord to put your religion on hold. Ask the Lord to let your systemic beliefs um, uh, go into pause and, 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 and then ask the Lord to examine your heart and to thoroughly reveal your heart to you and allow you to see his heart, your heart as he sees it and, and show you where it's out of balance because we're all out of balance. We're in a system that perpetuates imbalance because the more you're off balance, then the more you want to lean upon this system and the less dependency you have on God. So I pray that by the Holy Spirit that the Lord brought forth a revelation. So Father God, I just lift up this message to you. I seal it in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name that, you know, the spirit of truth, Lord, this, your Holy Spirit, will uh, go forth and start to plow the ground so that if you want us to proceed on with this message that the ground will be prepared to receive lord the further revelation that you have for us now lord we bless you we glorify you because lord you have created us in your image and in your likeness and just as we love and honor you i pray father that we will start to love and honor all human beings, Lord, no matter what we think of them or no matter what our earthly judgments and earthly knowledge tries to tell us about that individual. Perhaps the people that we think need to get saved are just reflecting the fact that we are lacking in our own salvation. So, Father, let your truth come forward. Let it come in a way that it can be received and understood and, and that it can take um, the condition of our heart and transform our hearts into the purity and the holiness that you desire for this sanctuary, this heart sanctuary to be in this body and in this ministry and in this family. In Jesus' name, amen.